I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less troubled by, and that has made all the difference. You know, I took a decision, either I could be very successful in my career in the medical profession, and I guess become very rich, or I could try to make a difference to humanity. I was watching television with my son and I, you know, I kept saying, well, I wanted to help in this disaster in North Korea and you know, Bosnia and everything and I never went. And I was actually sitting with him and he was five years old watching the news and he just looked at me very innocently at five saying, but you're a doctor, why aren't you helping them? And that really, you know, I said, he's absolutely right. This is something I've always wanted to do and I, there's no excuse now for me. Jamila was a, uh, an emerging figure in the humanitarian world. Having founded Mercy Malaysia, which turned out to be one of the most interesting non-governmental organizations, representing something that one really hadn't thought and understood sufficiently. And that is, how do NGOs outside the Western dominated sector really cope? What can they do? What can they offer? And I certainly think that Jamila gave all of us a very clear insight into what that could be. When the um, news of the earthquake broke out, everyone was focusing on care. We called our emergency operations meeting, we sat down and I said, you know, there's no news coming from Aceh and the epicenter is just off the coast. I bet you everything's knocked out, so why don't we make our way there um, and then send another team to Sri Lanka. So that's what happened. We you know, just emptied our warehouses and, and you know, really bit the bullet because it was a time that we didn't really have that much funds. When I arrived in Aceh and in the hospital itself, I think there's so many dead bodies and I can see that um, People are trying to, to ask for help. I'll straight call Dr. Jumila and I, I mentioned to her that this is actually the worst ever uh, mission that I have ever been. And I, I actually, I don't know what to do. You know, when I arrived in Aceh, it was uh, a little bit shell-shocked, to be honest, because it was as though, you know, this huge bomb had dropped on Aceh and everything was completely wiped out. and. And I had never seen boats on buildings and, you know, bodies everywhere. Um, still, you know, fresh and some were decomposing and people running around trying to look for loved ones. And it was just so surreal. And, you know, I still, I'm still haunted by some, you know, memories. Like there was a child that was, you know, my son's age who collapsed and came in and he had, you know, just mud and debris in his lungs. And it was just calling out for his mother. And as I was resuscitating him, you know, I, I thought about my son and I actually had to stop and you know get someone to take over and just moved away and wept for a while before coming back. You know, it was just the you know, the needs were just just so overwhelming and yet there were so few people there. People didn't have, a, you know, a mental picture of what Muslim women could do. And here was Dr. Jamila, who was up there. She was very smart. She knew, she knew what she wanted to do. She collaborated well and she worked well with uh, everybody, irrespective of their race or their religion. She found me in Aceh. She believed that I have this potential to do more uh, for my society and she felt the need to to mentor me. She believes in young people and she wants to nurture them. And because she believed that if she could help me, maybe through me, I can actually help others more. And that's actually Dr. Jamila. 
It's very important to Jamila that the local people become part of helping each other. And so she works a lot with volunteers. Uh, it's very important to her to, to empower volunteers, to train them, to use them in the work. She's also very pragmatic in developing local solutions that are, that are creative and not necessarily just providing aid, but provide empowerment to help people help themselves. We work with local masons, with, with the government agencies, with international organizations, with business sector, trying to tell them that, you know, we need to think now that we're not going to rebuild risk. And that has been my mantra over the longest time, that it's not just about going in to give assistance, it's about making sure we leave communities stronger than they are, and that we need to build resilience. Dr. Jamila stepped down as president of Mercy Malaysia after 10 years in 2009. She joined the UN for two years. She's now a visiting senior fellow at King's College, a senior fellow at Kazana Malaysia. She also is an advisory on several boards, nationally and internationally. She's one of the warmest personalities I know. Um, but in fact, she is also um, someone who represents and who lives humanitarian principles and humanitarian values. I see her as one of those who has really lived our school motto, ad veritatem per caritatem, which means to truth through charity. And are very proud of the fact that one of the, our past pupils who has lived this most fully is Dr. Jamila Mahmoud. It hasn't come without a price. You know, I know how many birthdays I've missed and eat celebrations and, you know, you, you, miss the years sometimes that your kids grow up and something like they're grown up in front of you and you know I always say to them I seek your forgiveness for that but I hope you realize that you know you have to share me with the many million children that don't have a mother to look out for them. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. And that's how I feel right now.